Good morning, everybody. We are a ministry called Blues Behind Bars, and we'll say a little bit more about that later. But uh, for right now, I've got to tell you the worship rules. Rule number one, you can clap your hands on beat two and four. They got it right here. Just watch that. Rule number two, you are free to stand up and move around if you like. I've often thought that church ought to be the kind of occasion that when you leave, your face should hurt from smiling and your legs should hurt from jumping around. I have not been in too many meetings like that. But. Okay, this first song is a mystery hymn that has been rewritten to give you a chance to guess what it is. Let's do the intro. One, two, three. Wanna be still, waiting for you, working your will, make me like you, turn me on that potter's wheel. Say, I am just holy clay under your hand. I'm under your hand. And here I bow down in your presence, oh God. Wash me just now, make me white through your blood. Try me in refiner's fire, make me like gold. Pain of your discipline is mercy I'm told. Mercy I'm told. Have your own way. Have your own way. Oh, Master Potter, I am just holy clay. Just holy clay. Let's do the chorus again. Have your own way. Have your own way. Oh, Master Potter, I am just holy clay. Holy clay. Holy clay, I'm 
just holy clay. Now I have a prayer for you all that's from this hymn. Anybody figure out what hymn that is? Have thine own way. You remember that? <laughs> the words of that song are awesome. And part of it, I think, is a wonderful prayer to pray at the beginning of a worship service. It's this part. It goes like this. Mold me and make me after your will While I am waiting, yielded and still Mold me and make me after your will While I am waiting, yielded and still Come on! Mold me and make me after your will While I am waiting, yielded and still Mold me and make me after your will While I am waiting, yielded and still Make me after your will While I am waiting, yielded and still Won't you mold me? Won't you make me? Make me into just like you Lord, have your own way. Lord, have your own way. Oh, Master Potter, I am just holy clay. One last time, just holy clay. Mold me, make me, mold me, make me, Lord. Just holy clay. Just holy clay. I'm just holy clay. I am just holy clay. I'm just holy clay. Rob Schmidt, I am the worship pastor here at Dillon Community Church. Welcome. Um, I'd like to welcome, this is Blues Behind Bars, and so we had to set up this uh, uh, to keep the... That makes us feel right at home, having those <laughs> bars right out there. <laughs> now these guys, they, uh, part of their ministry is they go into prisons all over the state. Is it within the Colorado state, or do you go outside as well? Nebraska. Nebraska. So these guys are going behind bars, literally, and uh, they bring the gospel uh, people that uh, oftentimes don't have any hope. So that's a fantastic uh, ministry that they have. And so we're happy to have them here. Thank you guys for coming. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this gorgeous morning, and thank you for the ministry that uh, these gentlemen here have to uh, preach the good news to those behind bars. And Father, I just pray that uh, in every single one of our lives, you would reveal to us, Father, what it is, where our ministry lies, and Father, how it is that we bring that message of the gospel to people, the message of hope that you did come, that you did die, that you did um, begin that process of reconciliation, that you redeemed us. Father, thank you for that. May we be faithful to walk the walk that you called us to, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. 
So just keep in mind that um, worship is not a spectator sport. Even though, you know, we have a setting here that's designed for performance and it's designed for concerts. And for us as musicians, this is a gift from heaven to play here because it sounds so good. <laughs> we love it. But that's not the point. The point is connection with the presence of our Lord and to be able to express our hearts in worship before him and uh, hear what he has to say to us. So the, the benefit, the best the benefit in this is put your heart and soul into just offering yourself to the Lord this morning. Um, we hope the music will be a vehicle for that expression. The songs may or may not be familiar to you. If, they, uh, if they're not familiar, you have three uh, choices. Sing along as best you can as you, as you learn it. Um, or just listen and let the words wash over you. Or sing something else. And, and that will be fine too. You know, the thing as worship leaders, you, know, you pick songs, but you never know where every individual's heart is when we come together. And so this is, again, not a performance. This is, um, this is interaction with the Lord. And we welcome his presence. And um, if you need to just pray, just call out to God as we're worshiping, do that. If you see somebody who needs prayer and you feel like you should pray for them, go to them and pray for them. Um, freedom joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what we're after. So here we go. This one is a call and response, so you can just sing back to me and just repeat the line. Oh, I long to worship. 
I sing praises to your name, praises to your name, the name that's so much higher than all names. Let's lift up praises to him. I sing praises to your name. Praises to your name, name that's so much higher than all names. All honor, all honor to your name, honor to honor to honor. The so much greater than all Sing praises to your name, praises to your name, the name that's so much higher than.
Your name is life. Your name is hope inside me. Hope inside me. Your name is love. A love that always finds me. Always find your name. Your name is life. It's hope inside me. Hope inside me. Your name is love. A love that always finds me. You lift it up. Praises to your name. Sing praises to your name. The name that's so much higher than all names. All honor to your name. Honor to your name. Name that's so much greater than all names. All the saints and angels, they bow before your throne. All the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. All the saints and angels, Bow before your throne, and all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. From you are all things, to you are all things, you just 
deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. From you are all things. To you are all things. You deserve the glory. All the saints and angels, they bow before your throne. All the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. This is about something that's happening in heaven right now as we stand here today. In the book of Revelation, chapter 4, chapter 5, it talks about worship before the throne of God. Angels, myriads of saints gathered around and it says that they come before him with harps and bowls which I think represents worship and prayer so what we do in this place rises before the throne of God we're not just singing to each other and things change in the heavenlies when worship rises Yeah. 
And I exalt Thee, I exalt Thee, I exalt Thee, O Lord, I exalt Exalted far above all oh gods. For you, O oh Lord, are high above all the earth. You are exalted far above. Can we all stand together and just sing this one more time? We exalt the name of Jesus in this place today and uh, welcome you to speak to us, Lord, as we study the word. We welcome your hand upon us in our midst, touching our hearts, relieving our sorrows, carrying our burdens, rejoicing with us also in the triumphs. Father, I pray that grace would be released for the various callings that are upon your people here to represent you and glorify you. Uh, as we walk forward from this day. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Do we tell people to greet each other, or is that okay if you do that? Or? No, what we tell them is to say thank you to you. <laughs> so good to have you back. Thanks for leading us and 
helping us to worship today. Welcome, uh, be seated. I'm Jim Howard, for those of you who are visitors, one of the pastors here at Dillon Community Church. And a couple of uh, three very important uh, announcements. Don, you can go ahead and start making your way up here. Is um, we have today, right after this church, over at our church building, we have an annual, our annual congregational meeting. Now, don't start applauding. I know how excited you are about looking at budgets and things like that. <laughs> this is the time. The members get to vote, but we invite all of you. This is a time to learn about what we think, us, the staff and elders, what we think about the year, where we've come, and where, we've, where we're heading in the future. It's also the time for you to vote on our new elders and our budget. So I'd like all of you to come. So be a part of that. So it's just a couple blocks over. If you don't know where it is, just ask anybody, and they know where Dillon Community Church is. And then um, our churchwide retreat, we actually had a couple of cancellations. I think we still have a couple of open rooms. If not, well, I'll be in trouble. So if you are still thinking about coming for the retreat, we'd love to have you come. September 16th, 17th, and 18th. And it's a time for our church and uh, friends gather together for the weekend. Church is closed on that Sunday, the 18th. And so we just have a blast. Picture, you're learning, you're singing, you're goofing off, you're hiking, you're going on a Jeep trip uh, at nighttime, you're standing around the fire, and uh, some people, the kids are running through the trees, and people are talking, and some people bring their guitars, and they're playing, and it's just really a relaxing and fun time. So let me encourage you, if you haven't signed up, signed up. Two weeks from today, September 4th, is our last day in the amphitheater. Some of you... Like I said, one week from today. <laughs> There's a reason why I'm a theologian and not a statistician. <laughs> Is it next week, really? Wow. You know, it's funny because I woke up on Thursday and I thought, yeah, I got two weeks before the congregational meeting. I looked at the calendar and said, I better get busy. <laughs> So next week is, a, is our last Sunday. And uh, for those of you that are visitors, if you're here, you're welcome to join us. We have a potluck on the pavilion just on the other side of the hill right here. You can see the whole reservoir. We get together. That's our way we celebrate. Some of you ask, why do we stop? Why don't we just keep going? Well, if you'd like to show up in the dark when it's in the 30s and set up, you'll understand why. It's just getting awful cool and late by then. Uh, Don, come on up. I have the privilege of introducing... One of my dear friends, Don Payne. He is a professor at uh, Denver Seminary, uh, academic dean, so that means he's my boss when I'm teaching, not that I listen to him. But <laughs> we co-teach a class together. We've been friends for, I don't know, 15, 18, 20 years, something like that. 25, but it still feels like 15 to you. Yeah, that's what happens when yeah. you're in hell. It just goes on and on and on, right? That's what I told our elders. <laughs> now, I have a couple of thoughts. One is, we have a really good staff. They tried to find a picture that was better looking than you, and look what they put. I mean, this is fantastic, don't you think? Well, <laughs> if, um, if you find anything I say helpful and true today, this is not me. <laughs> if you find anything I say ridiculous and unhelpful, this is me. <laughs> this is my good friend. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for... The very great privilege of, ha privilege of having Don up here with us this weekend. Lord, uh, thank you for what you've put on his heart, and thank you for all the people that are here, our friends, whose hearts you prepared. We so look forward to engaging you through your word. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, man. Have fun. Good morning. And thanks, guys, for lead us, leading us in worship. Very much appreciate that. Uh, yeah, you've got one week left in the amphitheater, and what I've discovered is that Jim normally invites me up here to speak uh, when he has run out of things to say. <clears throat> so right at the end of the summer, I assume you're, uh, you're out, of, out of words. Well, you're never out of words, but maybe you're out of gas. Well, I know you've been uh, through this summer working through a series on the book of Ephesians called The House That God Built, and we're, we're actually going to uh, take a little bit of an interlude to that, but related to that and look at uh, three verses in Paul's letter to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy. So if you've got a copy of the scriptures handy in any form, uh, look up 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 5 through 7. 1 Timothy 1, 5 through 7. Paul 
Um, I'll skip his little intro to this, but he says the goal of this command, and the command was to um, teach certain, have certain persons not teach false doctrines any longer. He says the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. This is the, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for that. Um, you know, many of our, our news channels routinely invite viewers' opinions about things. Uh, they'll invite our opinions uh, and our questions about matters from local legislation to our opinions about the coaches of local sports teams. Uh, they invite our texts, they invite our emails, and periodically they'll even flatter us by, by publishing them and, and commenting on them. Um, hotels and, and medical facilities just routinely uh, send us surveys wanting our opinions. And it occurred to me recently, I, I can't believe how many people care about my opinion. People I have never known and never will know, but they care what I think about things, right? Now, in, in some sense, uh, we're in a culture that celebrates ideas and questions and opinions uh, for their own sake. That's, that's not really new. We've simply found ways to commercialize that and sort of capitalize on it. But what we, what we do tend to do in our culture is isolate opinions and ideas from their consequences. It's as if we think uh, ideas and opinions are free-floating and they're detached from anything. Uh, we, we, we isolate ideas uh, from the real impact they have on lives. And there's no more chilling example of that than different regimes through history uh, who have engaged in ethnic cleansing based on their ideas of what it means to be a human person what we would call their anthropology. Uh, early in the 20th century, uh, Henry Ford had certain ideas about how human energy could be used most efficiently on, a, on an assembly line to, to mass-produce cars. And Henry Ford's ideas about human efficiency fundamentally altered the way work shaped people's self-image and the way it shaped their family life. It shaped all kinds of things in our social structures. And so ideas and opinions are not merely interesting. They have consequences. They shape our lives. Now, the ancient city of Ephesus, which you've been looking at here all summer, uh, looking at um, Paul's letter to that church, that city was where young Timothy was pastoring that church. And it was a place that just reveled in new ideas and new perspectives. Not terribly unlike the world we find ourselves in, right? And part of the challenge in, in experiencing goodness in the house that God built is looking at the consequences of ideas. Because this was a culture that, much like ours, was fascinated with fascination, fascinated with the exhilaration of new ideas and perspectives. And the Christians there were not immune to that insatiable quest for, for ideas, for knowledge. Now, I was, a, I was a pastor for a number of years, but have spent most of my career in higher education. And I have to tell you that living around people who love ideas is an educator's dream. Living around people who love to learn uh, is even a, a pastor's dream uh, because at least people, you know people are alive when they're hungry to learn, when they're interested, when they ask questions, when they lean forward and, and take notes. Pastor's dream, right? Well, Timothy apparently had a congregation something like that. And even though we might think, man, that's a dream job for a pastor, people who are that hungry to engage in ideas, Timothy's mentor, Paul, was not quite so impressed. In fact, he was pretty disturbed because there was lots of teaching and lots of learning going on in that Ephesian congregation, but it was not a healthy, flourishing church, even if it happened to be growing numerically. 
their personal lives and their relationships were, quite, quite frankly, a mess. And so Paul inserts this, this brief, sort of loaded set of comments into his introduction. And basically, Paul says to Timothy, let's get one thing straight out of the gate, Timothy. We can vet our grasp of the truth, and we can vet the character of our teaching by the character of our love. That is the barometer for our teaching and our learning. Everything else, Timothy, has to be anchored in that. Now, we've got to peel back some of the layers of, of Paul's comments because that could easily be misunderstood, that it's just all, all about love. We could import all kinds of goofy ideas into that. So let's, uh, let's do a, a little bit of a review of what was going on in that Ephesian church. Uh, we can tell from the very first comments Paul makes that this church was being spun around by uh, a variety of teachers who were, uh, who were simply false in Paul's estimation. They were not giving that church the true gospel. Now, scholars still puzzle over the content of what was being taught, and very possibly it reflected some strains of uh, what we call Gnosticism, which was kind of in uh, late first century to into the second century, what we call a knowledge cult. It came out of Greek philosophy and Gnosticism in its various forms, always prioritized kind of insider knowledge, mystique. It thrived on, on the mystique and the mysterious and the esoteric. It catered to people's uh, need for intrigue. But in some strange way, they, these false teachers seem to have blended these strains of Gnosticism with some aspects of the Judaism of their time, because some, some focus was there on dietary rituals and, and on the Old Testament law. Well, whatever it was, it must have sounded pretty good, pretty compelling, pretty engaging, uh, and probably because it played to their sense and all of our sense in some ways for a sense of control a sense of insider knowledge of God and God's ways so that we could, we could predict God and God's ways. Uh, isn't, there, isn't there something kind of inside many of us that wants a, a tight schematic for everything in life? A tight schematic so that we've got kind of an inside track to know what God's going to do next so that God becomes not just faithful, but God becomes predictable. And that's a, there's a big difference between those. I mean, Paul saw how captivating these, these teachings were, that, but they were throwing Christians back into the captivity from which Christ had set them free. And these teachings, however compelling they seemed to be, they were putting believers back into the, the fog from which the, the Lord Jesus had delivered them. And Paul had to kind of strip away some of these these pretty lay, these layers of pretty spiritual paint that were basically covering rust and give them some criteria for how do you recognize sound teaching, life-giving teaching, life-giving learning. And his comments actually drive them deeper into the gospel. So Paul tells them that love is our key teaching and learning indicator. Now, as I mentioned, he, he, refer, he references his command. He says, the goal of my command, and he's talking about his command to Timothy to tell the false teachers to stop it. But by implication, he's talking about the results of true doctrine, of sound doctrine, that which is true, that which has implications, life-giving implications. Now, as an educator, I, I deal a lot in course syllabi. Uh, those of you who uh, can remember your own experience, perhaps in higher education, probably are developing a, a bit of a twitch or a, maybe some PTSD from that right now as you think about course syllabi. Um, but one thing we do when we write course syllabi is have learning objectives. And our learning objectives uh, st uh, state what students are intended to learn or what they are intended to be able to do or be able to know, and our activities and our our, our exams and all of that has to align with what we want students to know and learn. And so if Paul had a set of course objectives here, love would be his first course objective. In other words, you will know that you have genuinely learned what Paul and the gospel want you to learn 
if you have love. That's the primary course objective. Now, why would Paul make a statement like that? Is that not maybe obvious? Well, clearly, what was going on in that church did not produce those results, even though it was quite interesting and compelling. And that's worth our attention, because teaching that ultimately destroys or corrodes life does not always appear that way at first. Some of the most compelling ideas that float around in our culture, and sometimes even in churches, are ideas that ultimately corrode life, that, that put us in the fog. I... Uh, I have a memory of when I was a senior in high school, uh, or a little bit before that, my dad gave me the use of an old car. Uh, it was a 1961 Ford Fairlane, uh, and it was old even at that time. Even when I was in high school, that was old. And that car had been so worn out that the, the front-end suspension was pretty much gone. But we had an auto mechanic uh, a family friend who was an auto mechanic, and he helped me, or I helped him, or maybe more truthfully, I watched him, calling it help, uh, rebuild the entire suspension on the front end of that 1961 Ford Fairlane. And it was as tight as it could be. It was, a, it was a thing of beauty. I was just about to drive that thing across country to college when my grandfather uh, came to visit us. I told him what we had done to rebuild this front-end suspension on the Ford Fairlane, and he, uh, he said, now son, if you want those bushings to last, you need to spray them all down good with WD-40. I don't hear any laughs, so I assume that means you don't know what that means. <laughs> well, um, you, may, you may be, or you may be married to somebody who thinks that anything can be fixed with WD-40 and duct tape, right? You, you know somebody like that if you're not that person. Right. Um, so I did that. My papa told me to do that, so I hosed down all of those new front-end suspension bushings with WD-40. I drove that fair lane across the country to, to college, and after one semester, I drove back for Christmas, and I could turn the wheel about like that without even turning the car because the front end was gone. What I didn't realize until much later is that WD-40 is a petroleum-based lubricant which eats rubber. Um, what sounded like a really good idea, lubricate those rubber bushings, uh, actually in pretty short order, destroyed them. And uh, there are lots of ideas, even good-sounding religious ideas, sometimes with gospel language pasted on them that ultimately destroy our lives because they do not lead to the result of the gospel, which is love. So the character of, the, of, of this love is where the gospel really shines. Now, we've got to look a little bit more closely at that because otherwise we could fall into this deadly trap of thinking that, that anything you want to teach, anything you believe is fine as long as it stirs a certain emotion. But that just throws us back to the Beatles and the Righteous Brothers, doesn't it? All you need is love. Oh, you've lost that loving feeling. Right? Now, only you old geezers are laughing at that because only geezers know who the Righteous Brothers are. Um, but, but one of our leading biblical scholars, Phil Towner, says that, that this love, this biblical word agape, stands for the active response to God's grace that is expressed in sacrificial action on behalf of others. That's a different character of love. This is a type of love that for all of us is counterintuitive. This is the type of love that does not keep score, as Paul says elsewhere, that does not harbor bitterness. This is the type of love that approaches people we would naturally want nothing to do with, or people who have opinions about things that we find abrasive, and says to them, tell me more about that. Help me understand where you're coming from. This is the type of love that makes the sacrifices for those we don't naturally want to be friends with. This is counterintuitive love. This is love that is not natural for us. Not simply loving feelings or, you know, the kind of fireside and hot chocolate emotion that we love to associate with love. This, Paul says, is love that's animated by a pure heart. In other words, it's love that comes from a genuine love for God. Uh, from genuinely knowing that we're loved by God. You know the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all of who you are. And the second 
to love our neighbors as ourselves grows out of that. In other words, this descriptor of love sets the bar for love because that's God's love. It doesn't accept just sentiments masquerading as love, and it doesn't accept selective love. This is radical love, love that goes to the core of what it means to be human made in God's image. And this, Paul says, is this is the real love that results from true teaching, sound teaching, teaching that tells us the truth about God's love and about ourselves, teaching that always moves us toward wholehearted sacrificial love that we can't generate on our own. And, you know, left to our own devices, frankly, we don't care to generate. I mean, why would we? Unless there's something about God's redeeming love, God, the, something about the character of God's love for us that would motivate us to do this. So Paul says any teaching that, that constantly pulls us in other directions from that is suspect. Any teaching that ignores that or has the opposite effect is to be avoided like the plague. This is love that is animated and shaped by a pure heart, a pure heart that's been shaped by God's love. Paul says, secondly, that this is love that's, that's animated and shaped by a good conscience. In other words, this love is only possible for those whose, whose consciences have been cleansed by what only God can do, not by, you know, uh, by, by retribution or, or uh, uh, acts of moral virtue that we can conjure up on our own, but only by what God can do for us and only by what God has done for us through Jesus Christ to deal with our sin, to deal with everything that alienates us and separates us from God. Only God can do that, and that's what cleanses our consciences and allows us to, to, come, before, uh, to come before God and to come before others with genuine love. It's, it's not a statement that we can love only if we have none, done nothing wrong. To have a, a good conscience in this sense is not a statement that that would because like that because that would eliminate all of us right if you are familiar with uh, what the prophet Isaiah went through and uh, it's recorded in the sixth chapter of his uh, his book uh, you know that the prophet Isaiah who was God's appointed spokesperson uh, he encounters the living God and what's the first thing he realizes he says I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips but what does the Lord do the Lord pulls a coal from the fire and touches it to his mouth and cleanses him and purifies him. So that love, love that is from a clean conscience is love that's accessible to all of us because it's not a moral state we attain. It's love that emerges from this stunned realization that God has cleansed us. Cleansed us. God, God has done for us what no amount of groveling, no amount of self-determination, no amount of self-loathing, no amount of good intentions, no amount of self-help can do. That's a clean conscience. Thirdly, Paul says this is love that's animated and shaped by sincere faith. We can describe this most simply as just a humble, an entirely humble and open posture toward the gospel, a sincere faith. Uh, this is love that, uh, uh, this is faith that's like a child. There's no guile, no need to manipulate, no need to control but we, we approach God and we approach others with a posture to learn. You know, I sin, it, it, it's not just sincerity. This is not the sincerity gospel. The sincerity gospel says that as long as you're sincere, anything you want to believe is okay. But you know, I sincerely believed that WD-40 would be good for the bushings on the, my car. And I was, as sincere as I was, I was objectively wrong. I was wrong because that was simply not the case. And so this faith, this is sincere in its genuine acceptance of that apostolic message that, that all of God's self-revelation is summarized in Jesus Christ and his work to redeem us. So all three of these features, a pure heart, a good conscience, a, a sincere faith, they reflect a, a humility before God that then reflects our posture toward others. And the result of this truth is love, and love that reflects the character of the truth. Now, there's, there's more to be said about the gospel than that, but there's never less to be said than that. And that's what leads us to these last couple of comments Paul makes, uh, because it's possible to get some of the technical facts about the gospel straight, but still miss the heart of it. And Paul exposes that that seems to have been going on with some of these false teachers in Ephesus. 
In verse 6, he says that they have, they have engaged in myths and endless ge- genealogies. They've obsessed about that. They've, they've engaged in speculation that was just ungrounded, untethered. And that's problematic because only the gospel truth, only the truth of the gospel can give us the confidence, the assured trust in God to pay the price of love, to take the risks of love. Uh, otherwise, this speculative approach that these false teachers took just engendered doubt and uncertainty. Um, there, are, there are lots of questions. We, uh, we have to deal with those questions honestly. I have a bucket load of them myself, and sometimes they torture me. Uh, but the difference is the role the questions play. When questions become more fashionable than answers, when speculation becomes more fashionable than solid grounding in the truth of what God alone can do to redeem us and love us through Jesus, then those questions are headed down a blind alley. The, uh, the early 20th century British journalist G.K. Chesterton said that the point of an open mind is very similar to the point of an open mouth. It's to close it on something solid. And that's what Paul wants for us. Um, otherwise, we're, uh, we're very much like What Shakespeare's Macbeth said about life after realizing his life had come to nothing, he said, what? It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Paul shines his gospel spotlight on these teachers in Ephesus because they were engaging in speculation that left people with no gospel, no good news, no redemption, and ultimately no love. And in verse 7, he uh, he gets right to the heart of the matter about these teachers uh, when he says to them that they, they, in all of their learnedness, do not really know the Scriptures. They do not really know what they're talking about, he says. Now, there's one other place where we find a similar statement. It's in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 39. Jesus is having an exchange with the religious leaders of his day. Uh, and Jesus says to those religious leaders, you study the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but you do not see that they point to me. Now, if I had been one of those religious teachers, I would have been quite offended because I would have said, uh, hey, look, pal, like this is my job, you know, knowing the scriptures, that's like my job. How do you, what do you mean I study the scriptures, but I don't know what they're talking about? Well, the early church read their Old Testament scriptures through the lens of how Jesus Christ and his redeeming work had summarized, had brought to a head all that they were about, all that God was revealing. And Paul says the same thing about these false teachers. They are learned in the scriptures, but they have missed the point. They look right at it and don't see it. In a really silly way, That's kind of similar to the many, many times I have opened my refrigerator door and looked and looked and looked and can't see the ketchup and swear to my wife, it's not there. And it's not there until she opens the door and it somehow magically appears. But it's possible for for any of us to even study this book and miss the point that unless all that we see in Scripture ultimately funnels toward what it means for God to self-reveal in Jesus Christ, to come our way, to deal with our alienation and our sin and our brokenness and our wounds in ways that we cannot fix ourselves, to do that through Jesus, unless we're grounded and animated by that kind of love, then we will never have love that's anything more than sentimentality or natural ex- we we can only be fully alive to each other and to God with the kind of love that the gospel gives us that's why the barometer for our teaching and our learning is this kind of love why we can vet the character of our learning the character of our teaching by this love now, to be honest, be very frank, when I look at the, that love, when I look at the character of that love, that love that comes from the gospel, it still in many ways seems way out in front of me, way out ahead of me. But that may be an indicator that even though I do know and believe 
lots of things about the gospel, maybe the gospel hasn't yet penetrated as deep into my life as I need it to. Might that be the case for any of us? That we, we might have the right words, we might know some things about the gospel, we may have grasped it and received it in a lot of ways, but if we look at the character of our love, the challenges to our love, maybe the gospel needs to penetrate even deeper than it already has. Paul puts out in front of us a love that goes way beyond what our culture talks about and what our culture values. It's a love that, does, that, that helps us discriminate between truth and falsehood, regardless of how enticing an idea might be. Paul actually portray, portrays for us uh, kind of the depth and the scope of the gospel when he talks about this love. And that means that the gospel just encompasses everything. The gospel, the way Paul talks about it, is far more than like some app we would put on our spiritual phones and consult or open when we need it. It's our very operating system. The gospel's everything. Uh, and because of this love that we see Paul portray in the gospel through this rebuke of false teachers, that highlights for us that we have the opportunity to show the world what real love is like. And in the process of doing that, we get to embody or enact the gospel. And even in a world that talks as much about love as our world does, that's pretty radical. That's pretty jarring. That's pretty life-changing. But that's reliable. And that's life-giving. That's humanizing. That's redeeming. Because it's true. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we're so deeply grateful that you have loved us and loved us first and loved us so deeply and so radically that you came our way in Jesus Christ and took upon yourself your own judgment against all sin and evil, our sin and evil. We're stunned by this. We marvel at it. We worship you for it. We thank you for it. And our prayer today, Father, is that you would make that ever more vivid, ever more compelling to us. Drive the gospel, that gospel, deeper into each of our lives so that this love that's not natural to us, this love that's counter-instinctive for us, will be the love that witnesses to the gospel and that pulls us together despite any and all of our differences. And let that, Lord, let that proclaim the gospel to the world. And let that give even greater life to each of us. In Jesus' name, amen.